February the 24th marks the anniversary of uh, the Ukraine war. According to the latest UN data, at least 8,000 civilians have been confirmed killed with nearly 13,000 injured in Ukraine. Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gang said China is deeply worried that the Ukraine conflict could spiral out of control and called on certain countries to stop fueling the fire. On Friday, China issued a position paper calling for peace and laid out its uh, propositions to a political settlement of the crisis. What's the prospect for peace while the West steps up weapons provision to keep the fighting going? How to look at China's proposition and proposals? Also, a recent expose by a Pulitzer Prize winning American journalist reveals the Biden administration was behind the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipelines last year, a story collectively shunned by influential media in the West, claiming lack of credibility. But the same media now are jumping on stories speculating that China is about to provide lethal support to Russia, citing exclusive information. What's going on? I had the opportunity to talk to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, President of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and Director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. What is the significance of the Chinese vision for how to achieve global security on such a juncture? What China has been saying about the Ukraine war and this uh, new document and new security initiative are extremely important. China recognized from the very start that there were true security interests on both sides, Ukraine and Russia, that need to be observed in order for this war to end and that they can be observed, that they should be reflected and respected through dialogue and negotiation and that continued war and escalation was dangerous, devastating for Ukraine and unnecessary. The principles that China has put forward in my mind are correct. China understood that this was a war that has underlying political provocations. In my opinion, uh, the US intention to enlarge its military alliance, NATO to Ukraine and to Georgia, crossed an essential uh, Russian red line, and in my view, an understandable Russian red line. The United States participated in the overthrow of a duly elected constitutional president of Ukraine in February 2014. We're actually not at the first anniversary of this war, we're at the ninth anniversary of this war because the war started with the overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych and then fighting broke out. Uh, Russia also then took Crimea, uh, the fighting in the Donbas uh, broke out. NATO, especially the United States, uh, sent massive amounts of armaments to Ukraine. And so we're in the ninth year of escalation. And what China has been very clear about, I must say, all through this, and China has had good relations with Ukraine and good relations with Russia. It's not on one side or another. It has said that there is underlying politics and that the security interests of both sides need to be respected. I believe that that's the case as well. I have said not only from the first day of this invasion a year ago, or even for the years since 2014, NATO should not enlarge to Ukraine and Georgia because that is a security red line of Russia that is understandable and that if this were in a U.S. context uh, of uh, a uh, foreign power making military alliances along the U.S. border, I guarantee the reaction would not be uh, a happy or pleasant one. Uh, and so we should have prudence, wisdom, judgment, common sense to back off from war. But instead, we don't. We just have total finger pointing, no dialogue at all, 
Biden has not picked up the phone to speak with Putin since the war started. That is remarkable because the whole world suffers from this war and the two should be speaking and not speaking to a camera, just making public remarks, but speaking about how to end the conflict without further escalation and further devastation of Ukraine. So I am hoping that China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa, other major countries that are saying, stop, stop escalating. You're killing Ukraine, literally. And at the same time, you're threatening the whole world that the voices of leading countries that are not in this conflict will push the United States and Russia to negotiation and to understand each other's red lines, which has been a missing factor all along. Mutual respect and prudence will keep us safe. What is your take of the article published by, uh, written by Mr. Hirsch? And especially noting that you were one of the first people, basically a week after the explosion last year, you suggested that it was, it was the, the Americans, it was the, the Biden administration that carried out the bombing. Basically the sim similar conclusion that Mr. Hirsch came to. I think the Hirsch article is very credible. And while it has been rejected by the U.S. and other governments, they haven't provided any single detail disputing the article. It's just been a flat rejection saying this is a fantasy, this is false. But they haven't told any alternative and they haven't shown any single fact that is wrong in the Hirsch account. So for the moment, I think uh, Seymour Hirsch uh, has a not only a lot of credibility of a lifetime of investigative reporting, but has a, a credibility that comes from the fact that his points have not been refuted. And I must say, they make a lot of sense. Here's what we know about this that's really important. This terrorist attack had to be carried out at state level. This is a very hard to do attack. The pipeline sits uh, under roughly uh, 90 meters of uh, sea level. Uh, it is a big, thick, heavy steel encased in even bigger, thicker concrete. It needed a lot of explosives in order to blow up the three of the four pipelines. Apparently, part of the event did not succeed, in fact, because uh, clearly the intention was to blow up all four of the pipelines. But that shows how hard this was technically. So there are only a very few governments that could do this. The United States uh, obviously being one. Uh, perhaps the governments uh, immediately in that region uh, it could be UK, Norway, Sweden, uh, or Russia. But then you start to ask the question, okay, is it Russia? Two facts I think are important. First, Russia had no incentive whatsoever to blow up its own infrastructure. And second, now several months after the event, the Western intelligence agencies are actually saying quietly, but reported in the, Wall in the Washington Post of all places, that there is zero evidence that Russia had anything to do with this. To my mind, that leaves the United States, UK, uh, as I say, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Norway, Poland, perhaps uh, as those who carried it out. I can assure you uh, that if any of the others carried it out, they did it with the knowledge and cooperation of the United States. This was a difficult technical feat. This requires tremendous technological capacity it requires cover because this is a region that is heavily monitored by U.S. and other intelligence and, and uh, military services. So you have, have to have deep cover to be able to carry this out. And then finally, I would just come to motive and statements. American politicians hated Nord Stream. They hated Nord Stream too. 
There wasn't almost a day that went by when they said what a disgraceful project Nord Stream is. On February 7, 2022, President Biden famously said in a press briefing together with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, if Russia invades, Nord Stream 2 is over. And the reporter asked him, Mr. President, how can you say that? This is not a U.S. project. This is a Russia-German project. Right. How do you say that? He said, believe me, we have our ways. Uh, after the event, the U.S. Secretary of State said this was a tremendous opportunity to wean Europe off of Russian energy. Strange statement if you are concerned about international terrorism on international infrastructure. Right. And then well, more recently than that, the Under Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, said how delighted she and the administration are that Nord Stream 2 is a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. Yeah. Uh, it's not, uh, not the way to speak about uh, an event that has massive danger and massive potential repercussions. You know, this is uh, incredible in many different ways, as you have pointed out. First of all, um, the, the source with the direct knowledge to the operational uh, planning called this an act of war. You know, you can hate a pipeline, you can hate uh, an enemy, a country, a government, but to actually do it, you know, to actually go and carry out this whole thing after nine months of meticulous and, you know, clandestine uh, discussion, debates and preparation and all the maneuvering and actually do it. This is just unbelievable. I mean, the United States talk about, you know, rule of the, the rule of law, you know, uh, rule based international order that, you know, country need to be democratic uh, uh, whatsoever. And, and deep down, this is something that the United that the Biden administration carried out. It, it is a, it's, it's, it's really taking it to an, to an uh, unprecedented level in my eyes. Let, let me say the following first. I'm not absolutely sure that it is this way, but I think the evidence is overwhelming in this direction right now. What I'm really advocating is that the UN Security Council investigate this as a very high priority because there's a, another extraordinarily weird part of this story, which is that Sweden investigated what happened, sent divers down, and then declared that they would not share the information with anybody, not with their own public, not with their parliament, not with their neighbors, Germany and Denmark, not with the UN Security Council. That's a disgrace, I'm sorry to say. If Sweden knows something about who did this, they have a responsibility to the world, but they haven't said a word. I think the likely thing behind it is that they're hiding the U.S. role in this. That's what stands to reason. There may be something else, but there is no possible explanation of why they are not sharing this information. I worry that Sweden's role actually was to clean up the crime scene. They need to tell the world. What did they find? This is Sweden, after all. Be responsible to the international community. So I would say, if in fact the U.S. did this, I would say two things. First, sad to say, not for the first time, because the U.S. got into a very bad habit, now I'm speaking more generally, of covert operations. And since 1947, with the National Security Act, the U.S. has been engaged in countless covert operations, many ex of extraordinary irresponsibility. Second, if it in fact did this one, the world needs to know and the world needs to follow up. Many thanks, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, for sharing with us your insights on this very important story. My pleasure.
My one-on-one -on -one interview with uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, President of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and Director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. When we come back after a short break, as the Ukraine war enters its second year, there's a heating up narrative that China is on the brink of supplying weapons to Russia. Is there a campaign in the media to use the war to implicate China? Stay with us.